Hello, everyone. This is Matt Schlapp, and welcome to another great episode of CPAC Live. As you know, we started this show because uh, with the outbreak of Chinese corona, uh, so many of us are, are on lockdown in our homes, which I think we're all antsy and itchy about uh, getting back into the world and getting back to work because America needs to get back to work. Uh, unfortunately, I live in the Commonwealth of Virginia with a not too all-star governor who uh, seems intent on never letting us get back to work. Uh, but we've, we're coming at you because we all felt the need in the CPAC community to have a place where we can all talk with each other and figure out what's really going on. Now, this show is an extra special show, uh, and we're so glad you joined us. And as you know, you can join us on Twitter, you can join us on Facebook, and you can join us by just simply going to our website at conservative.org and clicking on the link. When you do that, uh, we'll be sure to give you push notifications on your phone to remind you of future shows. And to tell you, it's still Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 3.30 p.m. Eastern time. But why do I say it's a special show today? Well, first of all, we can spike the ball a little bit because our last guest and our last show was Mike Garcia, the Republican candidate uh, from this uh, important uh, uh, special election in California. Uh, the AP hasn't called it officially, but Donald Trump has called it, and so have most people who understand the numbers in California. He has a big lead, uh, and it looks insurmountable for the Democrats. So Mike Garcia will now be a congressman. Uh, and what's what, why is this significant? Well, Hillary Clinton won this district by over 50 percent, and now the Republican uh, in the personification of Mike Garcia has taken this district. This is a very good sign for the 31 Democrats who hold positions in Congress in districts won by Donald Trump. So you won't read very much about this because Mike won. If he had lost, we all would have read about it. We know how that works. But the reason why this is extra special uh, beyond spiking the ball is uh, there's a different way in which we're celebrating. And that is the uh, reconstitution of the state of Israel, which happened uh, 72 years ago tomorrow. And we know this was punctuated, the special relationship between America and the state of Israel by Donald Trump's uh, keeping yet another promise, and that is relocating uh, America's embassy uh, in the city of Jerusalem. And we have two really special guests with us uh, to talk about this because they're, they're, they, they know this issue. It's, it's knitted in their hearts. Uh, and I know they want to talk to our CPAC community about what this relationship means and what uh, the importance of the state of Israel means just historically and from a religious standpoint and from a culture standpoint. Uh, we have Julie Strauss-Levin. Welcome, Julie. Julie is a lawyer, um, and more importantly than that, she's a wonderful conservative voice who we, uh, you know, I would say collaborate with on very important things. We're really honored to have you with us, Julie. And uh, uh, Zev Ornstein, who's with the City of David Foundation, uh, who, uh, they're both Americans. Zev uh, is residing uh, in Israel and um, has uh, really played a critical role in some of these uh, most recent uh, discoveries. And so uh, let's kick this off by first asking Julie, um, did you go to Jerusalem for the uh, dedication of the embassy? I did, and that was two years ago tomorrow, as a matter of fact. And I'll tell you, Matt, it was the most, it was, it was like a surreal experience because in 1995, the um, United States Congress passed a law saying, we recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and we're going to move our embassy there. That didn't happen. It didn't happen through many, many presidents. And it took Donald Trump to say, no, I'm going to recognize what's historically and ancestrally accurate, and I'm actually going to move the embassy. And Ambassador Friedman said, okay, great, we're gonna do it in several months, and it's gonna be on May 14, 2018. And so I was there, I was there with some members of my family, and it was, so humbling to sit there and to look over the hills of Jerusalem and see that our embassy is where it should be, in the capital, in the undivided you, capital of Jerusalem. Uh, Zev, you are residing in uh, the state of Israel. What is the feeling on the ground um, uh, amongst Israelis about uh, the Donald Trump presidency? I, I can tell you that it is significantly different feeling than the one that existed uh, a few years ago before this administration. Uh, I think you can say that his name. It's okay. You can say his name. I'll say it. Uh, President Obama. 
So, so the feeling during uh, the Obama administration was that the United States was looking to build alliances with other countries in the region, such as Iran, at the expense of some of the United States' more traditional allies in the region, and certainly Israel among them. And over the last, I guess, three plus years, the feeling has been that this is an administration that sees the value of the alliance together with Israel, but but not not just from a strategic military uh, perspective, but also from a values perspective, from the right. perspective that the foundations of both of our countries are right. rooted in the same traditions and same heritage and same principles that in many ways have their roots in Jerusalem. That's right. So I want to go back to you on that question, Julie, but I also want to tell everybody who's watching that we're going to uh, show a really important uh, scene uh, with Ambassador David Friedman uh, from Jerusalem, which you're going to want to watch. It's never before seen uh, video of some of the things that's, that are going on over there with these archaeological discoveries. Um, we're also going to have Congressman Lee Zeldin on uh, to answer some of your questions. But Julie, back to this question about this affinity or the or the, the the knitting up between the state of Israel and the United States of America that's more than just our like constitutional principles it's deeper right it it is deeper but before i answer you if i may just to give our our viewers um sort of an understanding this feeling that we don't have here but that when you walk the streets of Israel no matter what city i've been in People come up to me and they thank me for our President Trump. I mean, could you imagine that in the United States of America, where there is such disdain for our amazing president? And I do think he's our amazing president. And I also think he's the best friend that Israel has had, both as a president and personally, I know he loves the Jewish people. I'm telling you, when just to, for a moment to get back, when I went to the embassy opening, and, and Zev can talk to this too, you saw huge posters lining major streets all over Jerusalem where the Israeli people thanked President Trump, thanked him for the embassy, just, just this overwhelming sense of we love America and we love your president. And it's just such a feeling that is missing here. And I, and I think... Um, I think our people, everybody who's listening here, who's obviously conservative, is starving for that um, that sort of recognition that our president just doesn't get on a daily basis. So I just you know, want to point that out. Yeah. Let me just d let me jump in on that, which is we went to five countries around the globe, uh, or had five international CPACs um, last year, and uh, everywhere from Brazil to Australia, we went to Hong Kong, uh, went to South Korea. We went to Japan, um, and what you what the dynamic we found, which I think you're echoing with Israelis, is that um, this kind of CNN constant noise of how America is being ridiculed because the international people internationally hate our president. When you actually go to the countries, you realize the countries have the same splits that we have here in this country, which is actually there's a huge percentage, probably even a majority in these countries that are looking at Donald Trump and rooting him on. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And if you don't think Israel is in doing, is praying and gonna make sure that its people vote, the Americans who are there who are able to vote for Donald Trump, they are because a presidency that is not a President Trump presidency come November 4th is disastrous for our country and it's also disastrous for Israel. Zeb, you, you uh, like, yeah, jump in. As I say, tell you, in, in light of uh, the conversation about the, the embassy move to Jerusalem, Jerusalem is a place that has no shortage of heritage sites going back thousands of years for, for Jews, for Christians. And one of the things that, that's amazing about the United States embassy in Jerusalem is you see every single day, whether it's local Israelis or tourists from all over the world, the tour buses now they stop in front of the embassy and people get off the bus and they go and stand in front of the plaque of the dedication of the embassy with President, Trump name, President Trump's name on it, Ambassador Friedman's name on it, and they stop and they stand and they take pictures. It is very rare in modern times to have a new building become a pilgrimage site. But that is what the United States Embassy in Jerusalem has become for people of all from all over the world. 
I think it has spiritual significance. I think also, as Julie was alluding to, the fact that uh, it showed the world that the United States is going to not just say, but also do. Uh, and it, it's an amazing thing. And, and to put it also into context, I learned from someone in the, in the, uh, in the military that generally there is no other United States embassy in the world where people are allowed to go in front of the embassy and take pictures uh, for security reasons. The exception right. exists only with the United States embassy in Jerusalem, where there is a protocol to allow people to come next to the plaque to dedicate the embassy and take pictures there because the United States recognizes what this embassy represents for literally billions of people around the world who have a deep affinity for what That's Jerusalem right. represents. It's an amazing thing. Yeah, an amazing thing. So let's go into this question about the anniversary tomorrow, the state of Israel. Uh, Dan Schneider and the rest of the ACU team was fortunate to, um, uh, to travel to Jerusalem, to travel to Israel and really talk with so many people on the ground, as you know, Zev. And uh, we, we wanna have a future uh, uh, CPAC Jerusalem, um, and uh, we're hopeful that that, is, that that will come to be. But let's ask this question to you, Julie. 72 years ago tomorrow, Israel started and uh, or was reestablished, I should say. What? Uh, how did it start out in terms of the relationship with America? Well, let's that's let me just digress a minute because as we talked about, Israel is the ancestral home of the Jewish people. 3,000 years ago, God made a covenant with Abraham. In Genesis, we read this, and we said, and he said, I'm giving the land of Israel to the Jewish people. And ever since then, after a, a, a little respite of peace, the, the Jews were expelled from their homeland. And it was, there was a constant pull for centuries and centuries. And finally, we, we all know the history, we don't even have the time to go through all the expulsions and the returns and the Holocaust and so forth. So 72 years ago, David Ben-Gurion stood before uh, the people and gave an Independence Day speech that, that talked about this and talked about the return and talked about the fact that Jews strove from generation to generation to return back to this land. And he talked about the rebirth of the country of Israel because of its ancestral heritage. And the United States was the first country, President Truman, 11 minutes after David Ben-Gurion gave his speech. And as we know, David Ben-Gurion went on to be the first prime minister of Israel. 11 minutes later, the United States voted in support of this. And the United States vo voted at the UN call, you know, for the partition in November 1947. Uh, right after that happened, the Arab states said, we're never gonna let that happen. We're going to push the Jews to the sea. Um, but the United States stood with Israel. And ever since the United States in one form or another has stood for it with Israel. Um, and as I said before, it's President Trump who has been the most steadfast, but, um, President Truman and and many other presidents since then have been strong well, supporters of Israel. Well, let me just jump in there, because what I would say, uh, I'm the Gentile in this conversation, but there used to be a bipartisan consensus in America about understanding the important allegiance with the state of Israel, and it went well beyond Jewish communities in America. Uh, it was widely held, and that's been shattered. And uh, Obama and Biden really helped to shatter that, where the Democratic Party seems much more um, hostile, and the Iran nuclear deal, you know, punctuated that. So, so look, our country is based on Judeo-Christian values. We see this in the Declaration of Independence. We know our founders looked to the Bible when when they wrote the Declaration of Independence. Life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, life, liberty, and the word happiness—they all appear in the Old Testament, they all appear in the Bible. Our country is based on Judeo-Christian values. And for many of us, I'm sure every person who's, who's watching or listening today covets that, that document, the Declaration of Independence. The, our Liberty Bell has, has a quote from Leviticus right on the Liberty Bell itself. And you're right, Matt, the, the goal of the left is to push religion and faith out of our out of our the, the town square, the public square, because if you do that, if you if you don't have belief in a creator, belief in something bigger than you, uh, which was really the whole basis for the declaration, then who do you turn to? You turn to government. And that's literally the playbook of the left. 
I agree. I also think when you remove religion, it's amazing how truth seems to be a victim as well. But Zev, um, the other thing that I think is interesting, we learned for our takeaway from our ACU trip uh, to Jerusalem is, you know, a lot of conservatives were worried the state of Israel started on a path to socialism 72 years ago. But under um, uh, Netanyahu and other leaders, they seem to be embracing this idea of freer markets and flatter and lower taxes. Uh, do we have that right? Yeah, Israel is a country that is uh, very ingenuitive. And it's, uh, I would say, in part because of necessity. We're a country that historically has been uh, in a very difficult neighborhood with billions of people who don't really want us to be living in our ancestral homeland. Uh, we don't have the blessing of some of the natural resources that our neighbors have. And that's forced us to come up with very creative solutions because there would be no other way for us to survive and thrive in the way that we have here. And we've been very fortunate to uh, be blessed today with uh, the freedom to be able to uh, lead and innovate and create. Right. And it's so been Zeb, a blessing. You know what, uh, do you know what? You know what's really interesting about that is you turn now to this outbreak of Chinese Corona. Uh, first of all, it seems like Israel handled the outbreak very responsibly. But second of all, we're reading so much about the the medical innovations that could be emanating from the state of Israel. I don't know if we would have thought we could say that 72 years ago. It's it's an amazing thing, whether it's the medical innovations, the technological advancements, and you know the Bible talks about Israel being a blessing to the world. And in many ways, that's what ha what's happening because the innovations that are coming out of Israel, it's not just for our benefit, but, but we very much believe that whatever comes out of Israel should really be a blessing to the whole world. And, and that's what we strive to do every day here. Do you, uh, Julie, back to this philosophical question about the underpinnings of the American uh, creation and, uh, and how it relates to what the Bible teaches and demonstrates about the state of Israel. What, what, do you think that we just, is it, is it the problem that we're not teaching these types of truths in our school system? How come so many people in America have lost touch with this? Unfortunately, I think the playbook of the left has been to a large extent successful. Many years ago, we know that Dewey had the idea, let's go in the school system. And from a, from a young age, children are taught, teachers are on the left, they are taught to not love, A, not love our country. And if you don't love our country, that means you don't love Judeo-Christian values because the two are intertwined. So the left was very smart. They got into the schools at a young age and they have been teaching generation and generation of our children first, uh, they concentrated on higher education. I think we all agree they pretty have much have that mastered. I don't think there's right. uh, too many conservative, if not even even-minded, forget left or right, just objective professors on campuses. And now the left has moved K to 12. And this is a real problem that we have to talk about because if not, if you don't, you know, education is everything. And if you teach the left mantra day in and day out, then they're going to poison the minds of our children. How do they know about Judeo-Christian values? How do they know about the Bible? How do they know that our rights are created and given to us by God and not by some government, local, state, or goodness knows the federal government? They don't. They don't. Julie, we, we've seen this. You know, you know what the indicator is to us uh, at CPAC is we've noticed over the last five years that it was always 50 percent or more were college kids. But another dynamic we're having is a lot more high school kids and eighth graders are drawn to the CPAC conference, which is this largest conservative conference in the world every year. And they're, they're coming. And initially we thought, oh, that's great. You know, kids are really, really getting into learning about the foundation of their country and the Constitution. But no, they're coming because they see the radicalization in their schools. And so it's really, you know, we can see the outgrowth of that. But I want, I want to go to ask Zev a quick question as we, I want to, I want to set up this video a little bit. Um, why is it important for people who are being taught not true history, right? Or even in some countries, denying the fact that there was a Holocaust, denying the fact um, of these biblical truths. Why is it important for the modern person of today to know about the historical discoveries they're finding in the city of David? 
I, I think it's very simple. The the roots of both of our countries are, are rooted, as, as uh, Julie mentioned, as you mentioned, in the, Judeo, in the Judeo-Christian heritage, which has its roots in the Bible, in Jerusalem. And many people who, who believe in that heritage today are coming under assault that you are just Bible believers, but you're not grounded in science or in reality. And what's happening in a place like the City of David, the place where Jerusalem began, is every day archaeologists are unearthing antiquities that allow a person to not only believe, but to know, not simply as a matter of faith, but as a matter of fact, the connection of Jews and Christians going back to Jerusalem thousands of years, to the heritage of the Bible being true, and one that has continued to influence and inspire Western civilization as we know it. And so you have on the one hand, whether it's the Palestinian leadership of the United Nations, who is trying to erase that heritage. And when you think of the two most hated countries in the world today, it's not Iran and North Korea. It, for many, it's Israel and the United States. And I believe right. the reason for that is because it's the last two countries who still believe in that heritage and they're under assault. And being able to show that it's grounded in reality, I think, is something very powerful to use in, in making our case. So we're going to be joined... Yeah, just Julie, we're going to be joined by Ambassador David Friedman. Feel free to jump in here and also tell us why his role is so important. Was that to, well, I, I just wanted to jump in for a moment and say, please. I had the privilege of walking on that pilgrimage road. And I will tell you, you're speechless. You're speechless because you know millions of Jews and Christians walk that pilgrimage road. That's where Jesus walked. It, it's it's unbelievable. I'm having a hard time even articulating it. It is so humbling because you know this is where our ancestors, Jews and Christian alike, went to the pilgrim from the Pool of Siloam up to the up to the temple three times a year. And it is it is such an amazing, I think, transformative and life life changing experience. I don't mean to sound like a member of the uh, Israeli tourist board here, but I certainly encourage everybody to make sure that they go to Israel because I promise you, I promise you that you will you will feel a changed person. It's it's an intangible feeling, it's an emotional feeling, it's a spiritual feeling, but you will, for sure. Yeah. Let me weave in this whole idea of this ecumenical message, this Judeo-Christian message, which is uh, uh, every night uh, the CPAC community is participating in two rosaries. And as uh, Catholics and Christians who are watching know that one of the mysteries is the finding of Jesus in the temple. So when you talk about the road and you talk about the, the reality of how important that was to the Jewish people to actually go to uh, the temple, um, uh, this is something that uh, really all Christians venerate those memories, and they understand how important that was also uh, for the Christian faith. So I want to encourage everybody who's watching, if you want more information about both the, the, uh, the Protestant prayer sessions we're having, and if you want to participate in the Catholic prayer sessions, it's over 50 days of these sessions. Uh, and you know what is on all of our hearts every day? is praying for people who are committed to freedom. And that means you're praying for America. And there's nothing uh, uh, maudlin about loving your country so much that you wanna pray for it. And, uh, and I also feel like when I see leaders like Netanyahu around the globe, I, I wanna pray for them too, because I feel like the globe's in a, in a critical position. And uh, we wanna thank each of you for joining us on CPAC Live. Uh, I think we're getting more and more of the kinks out of creating this web show. We're getting great feedback from everyone. And I think this discussion, we're gonna need to have more of them, Zev and Julie, because uh, you know this relationship between these countries and its people uh, have to continue. And so uh, we're gonna now uh, bring you Ambassador David Friedman for never seen before video. Um, about this pilgrimage road that Julie Strauss-Levin just discussed. So watch the video, and we'll be right back at you with Lee Zeldin right afterwards. Both words, worlds. Preserve the modern, uncover the ancient. So when we left the Pool of Siloam, the question was, how did the millions of pilgrims 2,000 years ago get from the Pool of Siloam all the way up to the Temple Mount? We are walking, standing right now on the answer. We are standing right now on the 2,000-year-old pilgrimage road. This is the road that our ancestors, all of ours as Jews, 
but Jews and Christians 2,000 years ago. This is the road that our ancestors would have walked on when they went on pilgrimage from the Pool of Siloam up to the temple on the Temple Mount. Not a road near here, not stones that look like these. This road, these very stones. Modern Jerusalem, the modern neighborhood of the city of David, is about 60 feet above our heads with Jewish families, Muslim families living above us, day-to-day -day normal life in Jerusalem. If somebody has a religious message, a political message, an ethical message they want to preach, where are they going to do it? They're going to go where the people are. This is where the people are. So you would have someone 2,000 years ago get up here on top of this platform, this podium. And it's important to point out all of this 2,000 years ago is under the sky. This is not underground 2,000 years ago. So you're outside. You stand up here. And if you're interesting, people are going to stop and listen to what you have to say. And if not, the next guy will get up and give it a go. Now, I was asked not long ago by a senator in D.C. He says, what are the chances that Jesus was here? that he walked on this road, that perhaps stood up on... I know the answer. Yeah, what's the answer? A hundred percent. There you go. That's what I said. Mm -hmm. I said, Senator, I don't want to tell you stories. Let me give you a conservative estimate. The likelihood that he walked on this road 2,000 years ago, 100%. Uh, but you were delivering a message of truth, which is what this is all about. I know you carry something with you uh, to deliver that message of truth. I've always felt, and I got this from my father, who was uh, an extraordinary person and a great rabbi. And my guess is that... His forefathers probably stood on one of these uh, on one of these podiums and preached uh, thousands of years ago. But what I got from him was the centrality of Jerusalem, uh, not just to the Jewish people, and not just to the Christian faith, but to mo the modern world, to the values that are essential to modern civilization. Welcome back, everyone, to CPAC Live. What a great uh, and inspirational video that was, and what a great conversation we had with Zev and uh, Julie Strauss Levin about the important relationship between the state of Israel uh, and the United States of America. And we're honored to be joined by one of two Jewish Republicans in the House of Representatives, Congressman Lee Zeldin. Lee, thanks for joining us. It's great to be with you, Matt. Thank you. And it's also great to have uh, our mighty comms director, Ian Walters, uh, who's going to uh, take over and ask you some important questions on this topic from our CPAC community. Congressman, thanks so much for taking some time out of your busy schedule today. Our first question is a video submission from our friend Jeff Dunnitz. Hey folks, my name is Jeff Dunnitz. I am a conservative blogger and a pro-Israel advocate along with being a freelance journalist. My question is this, Pro-Israel organizations have a policy of not showing favoritism from one e to either the Democrats or the Republicans. Anyway, how do we convince the pro-Israel organizations that it's ridiculous not to show favoritism because really only one... What do you think? That's a great question, and I believe that one of the best ways for there to be strong bipartisan support of Israel is for both the Republican Party and the Democratic Party to both be 100 percent strongly in favor of strengthening that relationship between the United States and our greatest ally of Israel. I would not advocate if support in the Democratic Party went from 100% to 60% or 40%, whatever that number is, I wouldn't tell the Republican Party that the Republican Party should go down to 60% support or 40% support to balance it out. No, instead, you should be encouraging people to strengthen that relationship, to value it, look at this great beacon of freedom and liberty in that, in that dark region of the world and, and help to make it even stronger. I would also say this, uh, the word of the use friend, the you know, some people call uh, others a friend, but they're not actually a friend. And I've seen that a lot with these pro-Israel issues where a member of Congress will be called a friend of Israel. But if that member wasn't there when uh, President Obama was signing off on the Iran nuclear deal, strongly in opposition of that fatally flawed deal, if, if that member of Congress isn't uh, there in the chamber, when Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu is coming to speak to address a joint session of Congress as uh, he once did. Uh, if you're seeing the rise of anti-Semitism in our country and you don't have members strongly speaking out in favor of it or calling out 
uh, those in their own party, like Elon Omar and Rashida Tlaib, or those who em uh, embrace them and promote uh, causes like Linda Sarsour, Tamika Mallory from the Women's March, or Louis Farrakhan. Uh, th the measure of the word friend, I think we need to uh, raise our standards and hold our true friends uh, to at least a minimum standard and not call someone who's not going to be there for us in tough times, uh, call, call, giving them any more credit than they're due. That, that would be a big mistake to continue. Congressman, earlier this year, President Trump issued an order recognizing the Golan Heights to be part of Israel as our official U.S. policy. Uh, what effect does that have for the future security of Israel and our U.S. foreign relations posture internationally? Do we expect some of our friends to follow the U.S. lead in this recognition? We're, we're seeing that. We saw it with uh, recognizing the embassy in Jerusalem, recognizing Jerusalem as Israel's capital. Uh, a lot of the moves that President Trump has made, you have seen other countries following suit afterwards. And to understand how important the Golan Heights is to Israel, it, it's you can't put it into words uh, to the same extent of just standing there on that terrain where you're looking down into Syria, where you can look uh, to Lebanon, you can look back to Israel, and you realize that it is terrain that can only be used for a defensive posture. And Israel is the nation that looks to use that territory for defensive purposes only. Uh, but if that was Syria, for example, uh, you would see the likes of terrorist groups or, or al-Assad and others uh, looking to use that terrain to launch it on, for offensive purposes to Israel. So I believe it was an important, bold move by this president. And I believe that just like we saw with the embassy and the recognition of Jerusalem as, as Israel's capital, uh, hopefully we'll see other countries following suit in the recon recognition of Golan Heights as part of Israel's sovereign territory. Here's one that's come in over the email um, about President Trump. Um, are the accusations that have been levied against Prime Minister Netanyahu in Israel as salacious and baseless as a lot of the accusations that have been manufactured against President Trump? Well, as far as the accusations against President Trump, the list, as you know, is uh, at this point way too deep. It's you know, thousands of different angles that they try to, to uh, they have been going after since the day he was elected for getting elected. Uh, they've been going after him since his inauguration for being inaugurated. Uh, and they're just trying to whip up any hoax and, and other excuse to try to take him down. Uh, so the accusations in the United States are coming a thousand fold from all angles, where in Israel they've consolidated behind uh, a much smaller amount of theories. And it's a, it, it's a case that uh, the prime minister in Israel has to deal with. It's still not yet behind him. Uh, the accusations there are serious, uh, but I, I really can't compare what's going on in Israel to what's going on here uh, in the United States because I have seen President Trump's opposition all day, every single day, going after him from every angle. Uh, and uh, oftentimes it's just pure fantasy without even a, a hint of truth. In other cases, They'll take something uh, like the July 25th call transcript uh, with the president's call with Z Zelensky and try to turn that into a, a fairy tale impeachment parody to try to impeach a sitting president. Uh, so it's been uh, it's been really wacky here in the U.S. I can't compare it to anything I've seen in our country's history or any other country. Uh, we've got another video question from our friend and influencer Grizzly Joe. Grizzly Joe asks, Israel has been fighting for its very existence since day one. How does Israel achieve a peaceful coexistence with the Palestinian peoples when the Palestinian leadership says that it is their religious duty to push Israel into the city? First off, Israel has to be in a position to defend itself. Uh, we should be recognizing Israel's inherent right to self-defense. Uh, we must understand that a nation without borders is no nation at all. That's important for us here in the United States and important for Israel there. 
So while they face these existential threats from all around, whether it's Hezbollah, Hamas, it's even the leadership of the Palestinian Authority and others, uh, it's really important and most fundamental that Israel is able to defend itself through this. Hamas's charter originally said that uh, you can't, uh, yeah, they, they called uh, jihad an obligation. They said that you can't negotiate with Israel, that any Palestinian who negotiates with an Israeli is not a true Palestinian. So it's it's this isn't just a, an accusation uh, that's not backed up with facts. This is actually in the Hamas charter. Uh, so as far as timing goes, you, if you want to negotiate a long-term permanent peace deal with anyone, uh, if it's any country anywhere on the planet, you have to have a willing partner uh, on the other side if you're trying to reach a peace deal and agreement that both sides sign. And the fact is right now, uh, in 2020, they don't have someone on the other side of that table who's willing to sign in good faith. And even if they were willing to sign in good faith, they're not able to develop uh, to deliver their people. So Lee, in the meantime, Israel needs to defend itself. Lee Zeldin, um, you're a wonderful uh, voice in the United States Congress. We appreciate especially the work you did from your perch on the ONI Subcommittee of Foreign Affairs. You were a, uh, a bright light and a strong voice against the cronyism of that phony uh, impeachment and phony Russian collusion. So thank you for all you do. We're really excited uh, and pleased with the feedback we're getting on CPAC Live. Uh, next show, Friday, 3.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we're going to have the great Sarah Carter with us to give us the latest on the document dump uh, that's been occurring uh, thanks to the great leadership of the president and Rick Grinnell and others. Where we're actually getting some sunshine uh, and the truth really will set us free. And the truth will make you realize that we have been right for four or five years on this whole uh, ridiculousness of trying to have a coup perpetrated against our president. So go to conservative.org. Uh, keep watching the show. Keep giving us your feedback. Lee Zeldin, keep up the great work in Congress. We'll see you Friday.